All right, so this is lecture 40, and I guess we'll call this take two because there was an audio issue with the first time I recorded this. In fact, I'm gonna pull up my screen recording software and just to make sure, yeah, it looks like everything's recording correctly. Uh, okay, so um, I'm gonna do this uh, hopefully as expeditiously as possible. So we're gonna do a brief coverage of local buckling today. Um, just know that homework 6.8 is due on Wednesday and homework 7 is due on Friday. I'm not accepting any late homework for, for the, the last homework because I'm uh, turning the solution on as soon as it's uh, due. Uh, and for attendance today, everybody's going to be counted uh, present. Okay. Um, as I said, uh, today's example or today's lecture is going to be on local buckling. Uh, and um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what local buckling is. We'll do a quick uh, demo on uh, classification uh, of sections according to local buckling. And then I'll show you what happens if local buckling does become an issue. How do you compute capacity? And the short answer is it sort of revolves around what I talked about today, which is uh, just use the specification. So I'm recording this on the day that uh, uh, we had class for the shear design, uh, the shear capacity example uh, in class on Monday. And one of the themes of, of that lecture was to use the manual, to open the manual to uh, uh, investigate the capacity. Uh, and so that's what we're going to do uh, here, okay? Um, now, just to get everybody back into the, the, the mindset, um, I want to go back to the uh, capacity curves for both columns and for beams. Uh, for columns, if you remember, there were two regions of capacity. Uh, there's an inelastic zone and an elastic zone, and it all depends on whether or not, um, let me turn my laser pointer on, um, and it all depends on whether or not uh, your slenderness, uh, how your slenderness compares to this value. So you compute a column slenderness, you compare it to this, and if you're less than this value, you're in the inelastic buckling range, and if you're bigger than that value, you're in the elastic buckling range. And the same thing is kind of true for beams. We have a quote unquote slenderness. Well, in this case, it's just the unbraced length, but the longer that unbraced length is, the, the more slender the, the segment in question is. Uh, but for beams, I re the salient point is we have three zones. We have a zone one, a zone two, a zone three. We have a full plastic zone, and then we have an inelastic range and an elastic range, and it all depends on how your LB compares to these two anchor points, this LP and this LR. Well, the same thing, so the, the overall point is that the spec kind of handles local buckling in the same way, okay? Um, let's talk a little bit about local buckling, uh, how we uh, assess local buckling or, or classify sections according to their local buckling criteria. We'll do a quick example of that, and then I'll show you about what happens when local buckling uh, is an issue. But just to um, uh, uh, dispel the, um, the, the, the suspense, local buckling is what happens when um, uh, global cr uh, uh, buckling or global strength of a, a cross section can't be achieved uh, because the individual plate elements are going to buckle first. So the idea is like, if we look over here at this sort of schematic on the right, um, this schematic, this is emblematic of global buckling. So in other words, the entire cross section buckles, you know, so the, the entire shape buckles, you know, to the left or to the right. But in the case of local buckling, what happens is, so if we're talking about, let's say, a column, we load the column in compression, and maybe it's not the entire cross-section that buckles, but it's just the flange, or it's just the web. Um, and that becomes a concern when that capacity is less than, uh, uh, essentially, it's global buckling concern. So if, if, um, uh, if, if local buckling occurs first, then there you go. Um, I have here a real world image of some local buckles uh, for some steel elements. I'll admit I'm cheating on this uh, a bit because these elements were taken from uh, a structure after a fire. So the, the fire, you know, weakened the steel a bit. Um, but I do like them because you can kind of see some real world uh, 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 local buckling effects uh, there on that uh, bottom flange. And that's kind of what it looks like a little bit uh, in the real world. Now, let's see. Um, the way that we develop local buckling limits, um, without getting too far down the rabbit hole, essentially what we do is uh, we use, um, you know, some mechanics and whatnot to uh, determine how much um, stress is required to buckle the plate. Uh, and then we essentially set that equal to uh, Fy, and we solve for what is the width to thickness ratio required um, 
such that that uh, 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 buckling stress w would equal FY. So, so th the idea is that we'll figure out how much buckling stress will will um, is required to buckle a plate. But if that buckling stress is higher than the yield stress, then we basically say we don't have to worry about local buckling because yielding, the idea is that yielding would happen before the buckling. So if it takes like 70 KSI to uh, buckle a plate, well, we really don't need to worry about it if the plate's made out of 50 KSI because it'll just yield first. Uh, and so what we do is we do some background math to back, uh, um, uh, to back calculate what is the uh, slenderness of the plate required for that uh, event to occur. And so for plates, what we're talking about is the ratio between how wide the plate is versus how thick it is, or its width to thickness uh, ratio. Uh, um, now, local buckling is something I could talk about for a long time. I actually uh, did some local buckling evaluations for my PhD. Um, what, what I was doing for my PhD is I was um, trying to develop and characterize these um, press brake form tub girders that you see here. and. Um, one of the things that we had to do, or uh, one of the things I had to do when assessing capacity was I had to figure out whether local buckling was going to be an issue. So I ran a lot of um, uh, uh, numerical models to try and figure out how much moment um, is required to cause local buckling. And so this is sort of a local buckling um, uh, state where you can see the flanges have sort of buckled out and the webs are buckling out uh, as well, but it's not the entire cross section rotating, it's just uh, certain components of the section that buckled. But I found that the local, or the, the moment required to, to buckle the section was well above and beyond the yield moment. So I essentially was saying that, that local buckling was, was not gonna be a concern. And so that idea is basically how the, the limits are developed. Now, the way the spec handles it is again, like I said, what we're doing is we're, we're comparing the slenderness ratio of the uh, flange and the web to pre-specified limits. And those limits are basically um, taking the uh, buckling stress, setting it equal to FY, and solving for the, um, the width to thickness ratio. And that's basically it uh, in a nutshell. Um, now the way AISC uh, develops this from a code standpoint is it discretizes between two different types of plate elements because keep in mind again the specs got to be written for all sorts of sections for angles for channels for wide flanges for for anything that you could think of and so the, the spec characterizes that into stiffened elements and unstiffened elements so a stiffened element would be something like a web uh, where with a web the web is supported uh, on both the top and the bottom so you can see here's the plate and it's got a support here and a support here. Whereas a flange is considered an unstiffened element because we're only considering half of the flange. We're only considered this part that buckles and the flange is only supported on this end. Over here, the flange is free. And so we call that an unstiffened element. So unstiffened element would be like angle legs, stems of T-sections, flanges, you know, you name it. The really stiffened elements are things like webs or uh, or maybe like uh, uh, elements in tubes, you know, like uh, uh, rectangular HSS, you know, things like that. Um, and what we're doing is for each of these elements, we're, we're needing a slenderness. So for the web, we need the H over TW. And for the flange, we need the width over the thickness, but the width isn't the flange width, it's half the flange width because we're only considering this part. Fortunately, the spec does a lot of this work for us. If you check table 1-1, one, one, you'll see this term compact section criteria. And all of the, um, uh, uh, all of the, um, the slenderness values are, are, um, uh, are reported there. So we just have to look them up. Uh, see. Um, <clears throat> now, the way that AISC classifies uh, sections for buckling in terms of whether or not it's an issue, falls the same way that, uh, that we handled just the capacity curves. Remember for columns, we had two regions. We had an inelastic region and an elastic region. And then for beams, we had three regions. Um, full plastic, inelastic buckling, and elastic buckling. Well, when we're talking about local issues, it's the same idea. When we're talking about columns, we either have non-slender or slender flanges and webs. Uh, and then for beams, we have what we call compact, non-compact, and slender flanges and webs. So the idea is that um, the term compact uh, is basically saying that local buckling is not an issue and slender is saying that it is an issue and that we do need to consider. And so for columns, we either say the flanges are slender or not. And so if they're not, we call them compact. So the term compact basically means that 
the uh, it's a stocky flange. It's a it's a beefy flange, and and, and um, slenderness isn't really an issue. Slender means it's a, a flimsy flange. So for beams, beams have three regions. So we have compact flanges, we have slender flanges or compact webs and slender webs. And then we have a region in between which we call non-compact. So we say it's not quite compact, it's not quite slender, so we use the term non-compact. And so um, for uh, uh, for each of these, we have limits. So like for beams, uh, we have what's called a lambda P and a lambda R. And it's basically akin to like an LP and an LR. It's just these anchor points where we take our slenderness and figure out where it fits uh, in between. Now we get these uh, uh, limits on page 16.1-21. This is all in chapter B. Um, <clears throat> this is what the tables look like in chapter B. Um, so they, they extend over a few pages, but essentially there's a table B41A that's related to elements and compression. So B41A is the column table, uh, and then B41B is the uh, beam table. And so we have the beam table, it's kind of big, so it extends over a couple different pages. And so for each of these tables, we have an unstiffened element and a stiffened element. And so here's all the examples of unstiffened elements. Here's all the examples of stiffened elements. And then we would find, okay, here's our width to thickness ratio. What are we comparing against? And so for columns, remember there's only the one anchor point. So this would be the one for uh, eye shapes for, uh, or for rolled eye shapes for the flanges. This is the rolled eye shapes for the, uh, for the webs. Uh, and then for beams, uh, same idea. For flexure, same idea. This is the unstiffened element for uh, flanges of rolled eye shapes right here. We have two anchor points, a lambda P and a lambda R. So there's gonna be a lambda P for the flange, a lambda R for the flange, and then a lambda P for the web, a lambda R for the web. And we're gonna use the first case out of all of these because all of these, uh, the, if we're looking at W shapes, it's a rolled um, uh, 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 flanges of a rolled eye shape, a W shape, uh, you know, obviously qualifies. Okay. So uh, to, to explain how this is going to work, we're going to uh, classify a W14. Let me get out of the slideshow real quick. Um, let me make sure my audio is still recording. Yep, audio is still recording. Okay, good. All right, so we're going to classify a W14 by 99 according to local buckling, and we're going to classify it for both compression and flexure. Okay, um, so the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to move my monitor down here, so I hope I'm coming through uh, in view here on the screen. How's that coming? Eh, that, that'll, that'll be close enough. Uh, okay, so uh, this? I'll, I'll prop it up a bit so that maybe I come up in frame a little bit. How am I doing there? Ah, that's good enough. It'll be all right. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is we need to um, determine the um, uh, uh, we need to determine the the actual width to thickness ratios for the W fourteen by ninety nine. Now again, we do not need to upload those. Um, or sorry, we don't. Sorry, we don't need to calculate those. We can just look them up. The the, the manual um, uh, um, reports those for us already. And so what I'll say is um, for a W fourteen by ninety nine. And again, we can look up these in Table one dash one. Um, we can calculate or look up. Sorry, I keep saying calculate. We don't need to calculate them. That's the whole point. Uh, we can look up BF over 2TF, which for a W14 by 99 is 9.14, and then an H over TW is uh, 23.5. Okay. So these are pretty straight for lookups. Okay. So now we need to classify these sections, and we're going to do two classifications. We're going to classify according to compression and classify according to compression. Let's do compression first. Okay, so essentially what I'm doing here is I'm trying to figure out if I use a W14 by 99 as a column, is it going, is local buckling going to be a concern? Okay, so in order to do that, I'm going to need to figure out um, my anchor point value. So I'm going to have a lambda R for the flange and a lambda R for the web. Okay, so just to make sure we're clear on where these come from, so I'm here in the spec, I'm in table B41A. Remember, there's uh, un so this is on 16.1-21. I have the unstiffened element section. I have the stiffened element section. 
For the unstiffened element section, I've got a series of cases. I find the case that works for me, in which case it's a flange of a rolled eye shape. And here's my limit, 0 0.56 square root of E over Fy. So, <clears throat> uh, let's, let's write all this out. So, E over Fy, which is 0 0.56 KSI, KSI, uh, and then when we chug this out, we get 13.49. Okay, so what does this mean? Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm comparing this right here, which is the flange slenderness against this limit. Now remember, flange slenderness is just that, a slenderness. The bigger the value is, the more flimsy it is. So I have a scenario where BF over 2TF is less than lambda r, sorry, lambda r for the flange. So what that means is that my flange is, it's, it's, it's not as slender as this limit. I have a stockier flange. Like what this 13.49 is saying is it's saying if your flange is more slender than this value, then you need to start considering local buckling. Otherwise, you don't. So do I have to consider local buckling for this flange? No, I do not. So what that means, I put an equals on here. What that means is that therefore we would consider this a compact flange. And I'm going to say a compact flange in compression. So if we treat this as a column and we load this W14 by 99 as a column, the flange will not buckle locally, is, is what this is saying. The section may buckle globally, but the flange won't. Or, or in other words, the, the global buckling will happen before local buckling, which is what we've been assuming this whole time. Now, for the um, web, we go down to the stiffened elements. So here's all the stiffened element cases. I'm in the first case webs of rolled, sorry, webs of rolled doubly symmetric eye shapes. Oh, I, I went down a page, didn't mean to. Uh, here's 1.49 square root of E over Fy. That's our limit. So now just to forewarn you, there are a lot of square root of E over Fy calculations. So I'm not going to regurgitate all of them the way that I did up here. Uh, I'm just going to tell you that when you plug and chug this, you get 35.88. And so again, what I would do is I would compare this term against this limit. And since the, uh, the slenderness is less than that limit, it means that the web is not going to buckle locally. Or essentially, I don't need to consider local buckling before I consider global buckling. So H over TW is less than lambda rw, so that means I have a compact, I'm getting ahead of myself, compact web in compression. Okay, so essentially what that means, I'm going to redo that one. So what does that mean? That means that for this column, Okay, that means that local buckling and uh, of the flange and the web is really not a concern. That really the only thing I need to worry about when I'm determining the capacity of this column or designing this column is what is the column strength before it globally buckles, which is what we've been doing this whole time uh, in the class. And so here in a bit, I'll show you what happens if global buckling is a concern. How do you compute the capacity? And it's, it's really not that bad. Uh, I'll, I'll just walk you through it uh, here in a bit. Okay, now this is classifying the section if it's a column. What about if the this is a beam? So let's classify according to flexure. Okay, so with flexure, okay, if we go to the spec, here's the spec. Uh, for flexure, we don't have just one limit. We have two. So we're going to have a lambda P for the flange and a lambda R for the flange because the idea is to figure out, you know, there's three zones of, of local buckling for, um, 
for plate elements with beams, just there, as there is three zones of buckling for beams. So we're going to have a lambda P for the flange and a lambda R for the flange. Let's go ahead and compute these. I'm going to change these underlines right here. I'll get rid of those. Okay. So uh, what I am going to do though, oh, sorry, my screen's getting away from me. What I am going to do is I am just going to go ahead and recopy these BF over 2TF for this section was 9.34. I'm going to put that up here and I'm going to put H over TW is 23.5. And I'm going to put that up here um, just so I don't have to keep scrolling up and down. Okay. So I'm going to have a lambda P for the flange and a lambda R for the flange. <clears throat> now, um, those come directly from the spec. Uh, here, I'll pull that right here just to make sure we're all seeing. Oh, let me close that. I'll pull that up here from the spec just to see where that's coming from. So this is table B41B, member subjected to flexure, unstiffened elements, the first case, and I, get a, I have a lambda P and a lambda R for the flange. So it's 0 0.38 square root of E over Fy. And I have 1.0 square root of E over Fy. Now when you chug all these out, you're going to get the following. You're going to get 9.15 and you're going to get 24.08. Now this is interesting, okay? Because here, that's our flange slenderness. And now what we're finding is that our flange slenderness is not, you know, bigger than one or smaller than the other. It's between these two. So really what we've got going on is lambda PF is less than BF over 2TF, which is less than lambda RF, okay? So this would sort of be like a zone two flange, as it were, but we're talking about local buckling, so we don't really use those terms zone two. Instead, what we would say is that this is a non-compact flange. And we'll say in flexure. So what we're saying is that the um, the flange, uh, if we're bending this element, we're saying that that local buckling, yeah, that's actually going to happen in the flange before the global cross section buckles. So if we were to use the beam equations we've been using so far to compute the flexural capacity of the W14 by 99, they'd be wrong. Okay. And we're going to have to see, well, how would we compute the capacity? And I'll show you that here in a second. Now, let's go ahead and do the web. Here, I'll move this down just a tad. Excuse me. Okay. So, I'm going to go to the next page. This is the page for stiffened elements. So, table B41B. Stiffened elements, first case. Here's our two limits. Um, so we have uh, 3.76 and 5.70. And again, those come just from table B41B. This is on page, I think, 23. It's just the next couple pages over. Uh, and you can see here's a lambda P for the web, a lambda R for the web. Um, so when you chug these out, you get 90.55 and 137.27. And so you can pretty easily see that local buckling of the web is not really going to be an issue because this term right here, 23.5, is way uh, smaller than this right here. So we have H over TW is less than lambda PW. So we have a compact web. in flexure. Those are two words. I need to stretch that over a little bit. That's better. Okay. And that's basically it. This is your answer. So what are the answers for this problem? It's that, 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 and that. 
So that's basically it. That Those are the answers. Because what we're trying to do is um, classify the flanges and the webs under compression and bending. And so we need four answers. And there you go. Everything's compact except for the flange and bending. It's non-compact. Okay. So let me bring this back up here because I have a few things to say about um, some of our follow-up examples and given everything, I just want to make sure the audio is still recording. Okay, good. All right. So now <clears throat> the big thing I want to clarify uh, on, on one thing is what happens if one of these limits fails. Um, it does not mean, and I've, I've said this before in class, it does not mean that if you put a feather on the column, it explodes. That, that's not what it means. It means that the equations that we've been using so far just aren't going to work. So let me sort of explain what I mean by that. Let me go to um, one of the chapters in the spec, which should be pretty familiar right now, which is the chapter for columns. This is chapter E. Okay. Now, one of the things we haven't really talked about um, is really sort of the full organization of the, the chapter. And so I want to say a few things about that. So here's chapter E. It's, it's in these seven sections. And you know, chapter one or E1 is the general provisions. E2 is sort of how you compute the effective length of the column. But I want to read the title of chapter E3. Flexural buckling of members without slender elements. And then look at section E7 where it says members with slender elements. It's kind of interesting. Um, we never really talked about what that meant before. This is what it's talking about. Basically, E3 is saying, don't worry about local buckling. E7 is, yeah, you need to worry about it. Okay, watch this. Let's go to the next page. This is a use, oh, I, I went way too far. Sorry, let me go back to chapter E. Okay, let's look at this. This is a user's note uh, in chapter uh, E. This is the next page right after you start the chapter. And what it does is it shows you a series of cross sections. So to, uh, a picture of, you know, are you looking at a tube? Are you looking at um, a rectangular HSS? Are you looking at a single angle? Um, for each of these, so we're, we've been mostly looking at these, you know, W sections and whatnot. So without slender elements, which is what we've been doing so far, we need to consider section E3. E3 is for flexural buckling. E4 is for torsional buckling. We, we, have it real, we don't really need to consider torsional buckling for most W shapes, so we've been essentially neglecting that. Um, E7 is the local buckling issue. That's what LB stands for, the local buckling. And by the way, if you look at the very bottom, you can see what each of these, um, each of these stand for and whatnot. So let me go down here. Let's go to section E3. So E3 says local buckling, not a problem. And what are the equations? Well, those look pretty familiar, right? Those are the column equations that we've been using this whole time. Those are the equations that you use when you don't have to consider local buckling. What about when you do have to consider local buckling? Is it hard? Not really. Most of it involves, so if we go for columns, if we go for columns, so here's the members with slender elements. Most of, of uh, so the way that the, it works for columns is we compute the capacity sort of the way that we have been, but what we end up doing is changing the area. The idea is that for columns, some of the area, either the flange or the web, depending upon what you're looking at, has buckled. And so we reduce the area a little bit to account for the fact that some of it um, has buckled and is no longer effective. And that's how we compute the capacity. And there's a flow chart for how you do that. I'm going to walk you through that here in a second. For beams, um, let me go to beams. <coughs> Excuse me. We have a similar user's note for beams. And so if we have a cross section where everything is compact, like we have what well, we've been doing so far, we just look, use section F2. Um, if we have a doubly symmetric section that has a flange that's maybe non-compact, we would use section F3. So let's take a look at section F3. By the way, we'll take a pit stop at F2. What's section F2? Well, that should be pretty familiar. That's what we've been using this whole time. This equation here is the same equation we've been using for zone two. We just use a little shortcut. We just say that this term, whoop, this 0.7 FYSX divided by um, L LR over FP, we just call that the beam factor. We just make that part uh, a little bit easier to deal with. Um, here's the FCR term that should be pretty familiar. 
What about F3? What about section F3? F3, doubly symmetric eye-shaped members with compact webs and non-compact or slender flanges. That's actually what we just got with this last example, the W14 by 99. And by the way, look, the following shapes have non-compact flanges. A W14 by 99, go figure. All right, um, how do we compute the capacity? We just have a different model. It's sort of a um, either a, a, a if you have a non-compact flange, it's very similar to the um, uh, uh, C sub B or the the inelastic LTB uh, model we've been using before. It's just using flange slendernesses or flange slenderness limits instead of LP and LR, uh, and a somewhat uh, similar model for the moment capacity. So <clears throat> I wanted to show you. I did make a posting on uh, Blackboard. I posted these two PDFs. Um, this, these are some PDFs that I prepared that show you how to compute the capacities if local buckling is an issue. And so the first problem that I have is actually the shape that we just looked at, a W14 by 99, uh, assuming that it's fully braced. Um, and so how do you do it? Well, the first thing that you do is you um, classify the section, which is literally what we just did. Um, so this is a non-compact flange and a compact web. Um, and so how do you compute the capacity? I mean, again, it's just if I go to the spec, it's just this equation right here, right? For sections with non-compact flanges, there's the equation. So there's the equation, and there's the equation right there. Same expression. Uh, the only thing that's worth clarifying is that the lambda term in here is just the flange slenderness, the BF over 2TF, uh, and MP is just FYZX. So I compute FYZX right here, and I compute the 0.7 FYSX right here. I leave everything in inch kips because I just convert it at the end. So plug and chug, and there you go. Really not that that difficult. Um, and there's a table uh, six one in the spec. If you actually look up this this section, I put the reference right here uh, for an LB of zero. You get a capacity of 646, and that matches what we compute here. Uh, for columns, the process is a little more involved. Uh, the long story short is that, again, you use the same buckling stress. You compute the buckling stress the same way uh, that you do before. Um, I use a W21 by 44. It has a slender web. Um, so the way that it works is that you uh, reduce the width of the web a little bit to account for the fact that some of it's buckled. So the way that we do that is we compute a height of the web, which is just H over TW times the web thickness. We compute an elastic buckling stress, and then we use that elastic buckling stress as a tool to adjust the web height. So we have a new web height or, or, or plate height, we call it HE, and then we just reduce the area a little bit. So we say that the effective area is the gross area minus the buckled portion of the web. So the thickness of the web times the difference in the original height and the effective height. Plug and chug and you get 294.3 look that capacity up and you look up and you get 294. So again, not very challenging. Okay, how are we doing on time for this recording? And again, I wanna make sure that it's recording the audio. Perfect, okay. So this is a lot shorter actually than the last time we did this, or last time I did this. Maybe it's because I've already done it again that it went a lot smoother. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. So for your last homework, the only thing I want you to do is I want you to classify a W14 by 43. So basically everything that we just did, just classify a W14 by 43. Uh, again, four classifications, the flange and compression, the web and compression, the flange and flexure, the web and flexure. Um, and that's gonna be due next Friday. Uh, and during that lecture, we are gonna be doing exam review. So do be prepared to come in uh, with questions. With that, that's all I have everybody. I will see you all in class on Friday.